I'm tired of being labeled. I'm an American. I'm not an African American. I'm an American. Oh, girl, don't, don't set up the started. Twitter on fire. It appears that tensions are escalating in Hollywood, with Raven Simone making headlines for not mincing her words. Rumor has it that she's openly criticizing none other than Oprah Winfrey. In response, Oprah is reportedly facing significant backlash. During their conversation on an episode of Oprah, Where Are They Now?, Raven Simone and Oprah Winfrey delved into discussions about <laughs> and race. When Oprah brought up Raven's 2013 tweet about gay marriage, where she mentioned, I can finally get married, the conversation took a serious turn. Oprah inquired if that tweet was Raven's way of coming out, to which Raven expressed her reluctance to be labeled solely as She stated, I want to be labeled a human who loves humans. I'm tired of being labeled. I'm an American. I'm not an African American. In response to this statement, Oprah playfully called out, stop the tapes, and warned Raven about potential criticism for disassociating herself from being African American. Oprah said, you're going to get a lot of flack for saying you're not African American. You know that, right? She then prompted Raven to elaborate on her perspective, and the actress clarified, I don't know what country in Africa I'm from, but I do know that my roots are in Louisiana. I'm an American, and that's a colorless person. In response to Oprah Winfrey's question about whether her Twitter post was Raven Simone's way of publicly acknowledging her the actress clarified, saying, that was my way of expressing pride in my country. However, I will acknowledge that I am in a wonderful and happy relationship with my partner, who happens to be a woman. On the flip side, I've been taught by my mother and other family members to keep my personal life as private as possible. I make an effort to maintain a balance in that regard. Nevertheless, I take pride in who I am and my identity. Simone shared with Oprah that she became aware of her around the age of 12, mentioning, I was looking at everything. However, when asked if she had a label for herself at that time, the Cosby Show star expressed that she didn't need language to define her attractions. Oprah questioned Raven Simone about not wanting to be labeled as to which the actress affirmed, I don't want to be labeled I want to be labeled a human who loves humans. She expressed her weariness of being labeled and redirected the conversation to the topic of race, stating, I'm tired of being labeled. I'm an American. I'm not an African American. I'm an American. In response to this revelation, Oprah jokingly exclaimed, Oh girl, don't set Twitter on fire. What? Oh my lord, what did you just say? Stop the tape right now. And that's exactly from where the speculation started. One fan on the internet wrote, Why is Oprah Winfrey so uncomfortable with her guest labeling herself as an American? Oprah humorously remarked, You are a melting pot in one body. To which Raven Simone replied, Aren't we all? Isn't that what America's supposed to be? I personally feel that way. The footage of this exchange gained renewed attention recently, circulating on social media platform X, as Raven Simone became a trending topic following the announcement of her brother Blaze Pierman's death. Some conservative ex-users expressed outrage at the clip, accusing Oprah of attempting to sow seeds of division with her reaction to Raven Simone. One Twitter user wrote, Raven, I love this! You get it! Sadly, Oprah is in the hate and keep divided groups. One more person wrote, Maggots are the last people who need to be talking down to Oprah. They are also the last people who need to preach on human decency. You moral dumpster fires need to move along. As people became aware of Oprah Winfrey's discomfort with Raven Simone's remarks, it triggered a wave of revelations suggesting that this wasn't the first time Oprah had experienced issues with black artists. The unfolding situation brought to light additional instances where Oprah may have faced challenges or disagreements with other black individuals within the entertainment industry. Toni Brankston experienced a dramatic downturn in her career, once being a renowned songwriter in the industry. Suddenly, she encountered a series of devastating setbacks, including financial hardship and a severe illness. There have been speculations suggesting a possible connection between her downfall and Oprah Winfrey. However, people have questions in their minds about how they both are connected. I, I was in shock. Do you take responsibility for the situation that you're in right now? 100%. 100%. 100%. Toni Braxton made a notable entrance into the music scene in the late 80s, enchanting fans with her exceptional vocal prowess and timeless melodies. In addition to her enduring success in the music industry, Toni has gained recognition for her participation in Braxton Family Values, a widely watched reality TV show on WETV featuring her sisters and mother. Despite rightfully earning the accolade of a Grammy Award winning R&B legend, Tony has encountered challenges in her career, with one of the most challenging moments being her decision to file for bankruptcy. She says to me, I hear you have Gucci flatware. I'm a Winfrey and I don't have Gucci flatware.
In an insightful interview on VH1's Behind the Music, Tony openly discussed the challenging bankruptcy situation and its reception by both the public and fellow celebrities. Concurrently, during a period of financial struggles, Tony made an appearance on The Oprah Winfrey Show. While expecting typical questions about her current situation, Tony was caught off guard by Oprah's unexpectedly tough line of questioning, leaving her in a state of disbelief. I read that you were upset about stories that your overspending caused this. During this interview, viewers perceived Oprah's questions as indirect criticism of Tony's spending habits, with the implication that Tony's extravagant expenditures were a significant factor in her bankruptcy. In response to Oprah's perceived rude Goodness, Tony replied, She was so frickin' mean to me. I was in shock. Tony openly acknowledged her deep respect and affection for Oprah before the interview took place, expressing that she had never anticipated Oprah would be as critical as she turned out to be during their conversation. She said, I couldn't believe it because I loved her so much. I admired her and looked up to her and she pretty much reprimanded me. According to Braxton's recollection, Oprah's disapproval didn't stop there. Tony remembered Oprah saying something along the lines of, I've heard you have Gucci flatware, whereas I, Oprah Winfrey, do not own Gucci flatware, while gesturing by bringing her thumb and forefinger close together. This comment left the star of Braxton Family Values feeling significantly diminished. You ain't got Gucci flatware because you didn't want to buy it. It's not because you couldn't afford it. What do you mean? And immediately, she made me feel this big. Toni Braxton's journey to bankruptcy traces back to the 1980s, when she initially emerged in the music scene as part of the Braxtons, an R&B group comprising herself and her sisters, Tracy, Tawanda, Trina, and Tamar Braxton. Although they experienced some success, Tony's solo career took a significant turn after the release of her debut solo single Love Shoulda Brought You Home in 1992. The song, featured on the soundtrack of Eddie Murphy's film Boomerang, marked her solo breakthrough and prompted Tony to venture into a solo career. Tony's solo career soared to new heights with the release of her debut solo album in 1993, which not only claimed the top spot on the Billboard album chart, but also featured popular hits like Another Sad Love Song and Breathe Again. The success continued with her second album, Secrets, launched in 1996, which became another massive hit, selling over 15 million copies globally. The album boasted the biggest hit of Tony's career, Unbreak My Heart, a chart topper for an astonishing 11 weeks, propelling Tony to unparalleled international music stardom. Despite enjoying a career that many artists would envy, marked by remarkable success, including record sales that surpassed $170 million for her label by 1998, Toni Braxton found herself declaring bankruptcy. She recalled in a 2012 interview with ABC News, The Vegas show, I just renewed my contracts with all my vendors, she explained. And then a month later, I got sick. I couldn't work and could not afford to pay them back. A female artist, despite achieving global record sales surpassing $70 million, found herself declaring bankruptcy not once but twice in a brief period. Surprisingly, Tony's financial woes originated from a disastrous record contract that severely limited her earnings during the pinnacle of her career. These challenges were further compounded by significant health issues she faced. How could anybody blow through upwards of $50 million? Well, start with a fetish for silverware and sheets, throw in a few other big ticket items, and mix with some bad luck. Fans were astonished when Tony filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy in January 1998. This was particularly shocking given that merely two years earlier, she had released the worldwide hit Unbreak My Heart, selling over 5 million copies and earning her a Grammy Award. Moreover, Tony's second studio album, Secrets, launched in 1996, achieved remarkable success with over 6 million units sold in the United States and an additional 3 million worldwide. Celine had Unbreak My Heart and she didn't feel I don't know what the situation was, but I know I got it. So we kind of flipped off there. Upon initiating her bankruptcy proceedings, the mother of two, according to court documents, disclosed that her music had amassed an impressive sum, exceeding $170 million in sales from her first two studio albums. Surprisingly, it became evident that the substantial income generated for her record label, Arista or LaFace, was not proportionately benefiting her own financial situation. In an interview, Braxton explained, I sold more than 40 million records, yet my royalties were less than $2,000.
What many people don't know is that an artist makes four to seven cents on the dollar for every album sold, and they have to pay back $20 million to the label for all the money that was spent to create, promote, and sell that album. A few weeks prior to this, sources indicate that the singer-songwriter responsible for Hurt You had taken legal action against the company by filing a lawsuit, aiming to be released from her contract. Her lawyer later disclosed to the LA Times that the artist was only receiving a meager 33 cents for every album sold. This revelation underscores the stark disparity, emphasizing how she was far from enjoying the rewards commensurate with her hard work and talent. I have my moments, I have my days, good days and bad days. I Over time, more details surfaced about Tony's troublesome record contract with Arista LaFace. Despite holding a prominent position as one of the label's top artists, executives at the company were unwilling to engage in negotiations for a more favorable deal. This included discussions for a higher royalty rate in advances. Rumors suggest that due to the label's lack of cooperation and their failure to offer offer the necessary financial support, especially considering her responsibilities to her team, Tony found herself with no alternative but to initiate the bankruptcy process. In an interview with Black Enterprise, Tony touched on the subject saying, after TLC talked publicly about their bankruptcy, the label prohibited other La Face artists to talk, but now I can. I sold more than 40 million records, yet my royalties were less than $2,000. People don't understand that this issue went all the way to Congress about bankruptcy. All contracts are null and void except for a recording artist. Can you believe it? But the industry has changed now. She also addressed claims that she had bad spending habits, which many believed was the real reason she found herself in a bad financial state. To that, she said, people were reporting things like, I bought Gucci flatware. Yes, I treated myself, and it was only $500. If I bought 1,000 count sheets, they were from TJ Maxx for about $49, so I wasn't living extravagantly. Yes, of course I spent money, but when you consider that an artist makes 4 to 7 cents on the dollar for every album sold, and they have to pay back $20 million to the label for all the money that was spent to create, promote, and sell that album, then, yeah, chances are you'll end up in a whole lot of debt. The situation was dire. During an interview with Oprah Winfrey, Tony Braxton revealed the harsh reality that, despite selling nearly 30 million records, she had received a shockingly meager royalty check of $1,972 from her album sales. She had been subsisting on advances from her label and income from touring. To make ends meet, Braxton had to part with her assets, including her property, clothing, jewelry, a baby grand piano, and cars. She even resorted to auctioning off her cherished Grammy Awards. Alongside the financial strain, she grappled with feelings of embarrassment and uncertainty about her future as a signed artist. You bet your sweet ass, because just six months ago, Tony was totally wiped out, owing more than $50 million in debt. As fans began connecting the dots between these incidents, their suspicion grew stronger that Oprah played a significant role in Tony's decline. This perception was fueled by the well-known conflict between Oprah and Monique. Many believe that Oprah had effectively derailed Monique's career, and there were even rumors that Monique was on the brink of homelessness. The lack of any public apology from Oprah for the harm inflicted upon Monique only added to these suspicions. So for eight years, for eight years, my family has suffered and my career has suffered because what I would not allow those entities to do was bully me. The reason Oprah did not apologize, according to some people, is attributed to her ego and pride. In 2009, Oprah and Tyler Perry jointly released their film Precious, directed by Lee Daniels, to a global audience. In an effort to capitalize on the media buzz generated by the film's positive critical reception, the film's producers decided to send Monique on a promotional tour. Monique herself revealed, I had no idea I'd been blackballed because I don't think that Hollywood has turned its nose up to me," said the actor, suggesting someone had decided to teach Monique a lesson because she's not playing the game. What left people in awe was Monique's candid revelation that Oprah had been making unreasonable demands during their movie campaigns. This is what Monique said, We were out on the campaign and she was making unreasonable demands. And this is where reverse racism, I think, happens. Following this, there were allegations that Lee Daniels had made threats against Monique, warning her that she would encounter something unpleasant. It's noteworthy that Lee initially sided with Oprah in the dispute. However, as time passed, Monique revealed that Lee had made some peculiar comments about Oprah. Monique said, I think that those are feelings that Mr. Daniels is having. He said, you know, Monique, she didn't thank the producers at the Oscars. She didn't thank the studio, and that's just not things that you do. These revelations have led many to speculate that Oprah may not treat junior artists 
artists and staff well, especially those involved in movie productions. It has fueled a perception that the general public has harbored suspicions about Oprah concealing certain aspects of her behavior or actions. One person said, this woman is a hero and a role model, and the people who wronged her and never apologized should be ashamed of themselves. Another one added, so proud of Monique. It's not easy to stand up for what's right when everyone is telling you you're wrong, and she did it well. Makes me want to go down a rabbit hole of her work. Get this woman her royalties she deserves. Monique has openly shared her past experiences, revealing that she faced disbelief when disclosing the bullying she endured from her older brother Gerald during her childhood years from ages 7 to 11. Their relationship eventually shattered after Gerald was convicted of harassing another woman, resulting in a 12-year prison sentence. In a surprising turn of events in 2010, Gerald accepted an invitation from Oprah to appear on her show. Oprah even extended an invitation to Monique to participate in the episode. However, Monique firmly communicated to Oprah that she had no intention of appearing on the show, even if her brother requested her presence. To Monique's astonishment, Oprah took it a step further by inviting not only Gerald, but also their two parents to the show. This proved distressing for Monique, as it appeared her parents were downplaying the traumatic experiences she had endured during her childhood. I did assault and uh, inappropriately touch my sister in manners that were not comfortable for her. And for that, I apologize. Devastated by the situation, Monique found no solace when seeking comfort from Oprah, whose apparent lack of awareness of Gerald bringing their family onto the show added to her distress. When Monique encountered Oprah in Hollywood for the first time after the incident, she couldn't help but harbor skepticism towards Oprah's claim of being unaware that Gerald would include their family in the show. As Monique explained in an interview, she then said, Do you want to come on the show because he wants to apologize to you? I said, Oprah, I don't want no part of that. Oprah has confronted substantial allegations regarding alleged human trafficking and enabling behavior, with notable figures like convicted S offender Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein making such accusations. Several prominent individuals have publicly accused Oprah of either concealing information or supporting Harvey Weinstein, and one notable accuser is Rose McGowan. According to Rose, Oprah erred in her choice of association with individuals like Russell Simmons and Harvey Weinstein, whom she considered friends. Rose tweeted, I am glad more are seeing the ugly truth of at Oprah. I wish she were real, but she isn't. From being pals with Weinstein to abandoning and destroying Russell Simmons' sick victims, she is about supporting a sick power structure for personal gain. She is as fake as they come. Hash Lizard. Singer Seal is among the prominent figures accusing the TV host of connections to Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein. The alleged nature of the host's relationship with Jeffrey Epstein remains shrouded in mystery and speculation. Online discussions reflect a prevailing impression that she might have played a role in Epstein's choice of victims. Some have even entertained the possibility that Floridian residents accusing Oprah of involvement in a human trafficking organization might have been correct in their claims. These allegations and suspicions have given rise to serious questions about her associations and activities. Later on, however, Oprah disproved all of these rumors that were circulating on Twitter, saying, just got a phone call that my name is trending and being trolled for some awful fake thing. It's not true. Haven't been raided or arrested, she wrote, just sanitizing and self-distancing with the rest of the world. Stay safe, everybody. Further Furthermore, a widely known conspiracy theory posits that influential figures in Hollywood intentionally harm individuals to discredit or cancel them. Additionally, there are circulating rumors suggesting that certain Hollywood elites might have played a role in Tony's illness as a form of retaliation for a 1980s interview. Please welcome Tony Braxton! She was so freaking mean to me. While Oprah Winfrey is often celebrated as the queen of all media, there are instances where she may have fallen short, at least according to Cindy Crawford. The iconic supermodel expressed her perspective on their initial encounter during an episode of the Apple TV Plus docuseries, The Supermodels, indicating that she may not be entirely pleased with Oprah. I was like the chattel for a child, like be seen and not heard. When you look at it through today's eyes, when Oprah's like, stand up and show me your body. Cindy Crawford's initial encounter with Oprah Winfrey presented a distinct contrast to her later appearance on Oprah's Masterclass in 2013. In that interview, Crawford candidly discussed the influence of her appearance on her self-perception. As reported by ABC News, Crawford revealed that she felt judged solely on her looks, motivating her to proactively portray herself as more than just a physical present. I felt judged by the way that I looked. I think it set me on a course to represent 
represent myself as someone who has a brain, she said. Before her 2013 Masterclass episode with Oprah Winfrey, Crawford engaged in introspection, reassessing how others perceived her. Despite making 10 appearances on Oprah before that, Crawford's recollection of her introduction to The Oprah Winfrey Show wasn't particularly positive, especially when viewed with hindsight. The mother of two shed new light on the episode, contemplating how Winfrey's actions might be interpreted in today's culture. From Crawford's perspective, it seems there may be unresolved issues between her and Winfrey that need addressing. Show us why you're worthy of being here. In the moment, I didn't recognize it, only when I looked back at it and I was like, oh my gosh, that was so not okay, really. In the pilot episode of The Supermodels, Cindy Crawford reflected on her first appearance on The Oprah Winfrey Show when she was just 20 years old in 1986. At that time, Oprah's show had recently been syndicated. Crawford and her manager, John Casablancas, were guests on the show. During the interview, Oprah directed many questions to Casablancas about Crawford's body, asking him if she had always had her physique. Oprah then requested Crawford Crawford to stand up to showcase her body. In the Supermodels episode, Crawford commented on this specific Oprah segment, expressing her discomfort with the interview. She felt like she was treated as an object, stating, I was like the chattel or a child, like be seen and not heard when you look at it through today's eyes. When Oprah's like, stand up and show me your body, show us why you're worthy of being here. Crawford found the interview traumatizing, stating, I was so traumatized, I really felt I was not seen as a person who had a voice in her own destiny, as reported by the Los Angeles Times. While Crawford didn't fully comprehend the extent of the situation at the time, with age, she came to realize how inappropriate it was. After Crawford's public comments, Oprah Winfrey appeared to respond by taking down the interview from YouTube. Cindy Crawford publicly confronted Oprah Winfrey over her handling of a 1986 interview, and nearly four decades later, social Social media users shared their varied opinions. One person dismissed the issue, stating, I went back to watch the whole interview. Cindy Crawford was a new up-and-coming model. Oprah was glorifying how amazing Cindy's appearance was. Cindy, if you are looking for a moment to be a victim, you are truly reaching. Weird times we live in, where people want to be victims for a narrative. Even Oprah Winfrey's close friend, Gail King, commented on the situation. Despite not having seen the interview, King expressed surprise and a slight disappointment, saying, I'm surprised and a little disappointed, because I know Cindy's been on her show many, many, many times, and it has always been a pleasant experience. So, I would hate to think that something that happened years ago could have bothered her. It's not Oprah's thing to humiliate or make anybody feel badly. King also added that, to her knowledge, Winfrey and Crawford's relationship was still in good standing. Interestingly, in 1986, the billionaire shared insights about her interviewing approach with the New York Times. She stated, Vulnerability is the key. People appreciate when you can be honest. It lets them feel more comfortable about being themselves themselves, and later added, I understand my commonality with the human experience. It's worth noting that a dose of that vulnerability and commonality might have had a significant impact on an interview with a certain model a few months later. This is not it. Oprah Winfrey and Taraji P. Henson have been at the center of speculation about a rumored feud during the press tour for the upcoming Color Purple musical film. The rumors gained traction after a viral video prompted fans to analyze the body language between the two stars, hinting at possible tension. I almost had to walk away from color purple yes ma'am who said what yes ma'am in her memoir henson expressed feeling gutted upon discovering that winfrey who served as a producer on the film did not advocate for her to receive equitable compensation henson had anticipated winfrey to be a mentor and a role model but instead experienced a sense of betrayal and disappointment rumors of a feud between oprah winfrey and taraji p henson surfaced during the press tour for the upcoming color purple musical film where she discussed that she has always been underpaid speculation gained momentum after a viral video prompted fans to analyze the body language between the two stars, fueling rumors of potential tension. I almost had to walk away from color purple. Yes, ma'am. Who said what? Yes, ma'am. So according to these black actresses, this is how Oprah has been treating them. And now the revelations from Ravens are causing numerous artists to come forward and reveal the potential truth. That's it for today. See you in the next video. Until then, goodbye.